First of all, David, congratulations on uh, on the publication of this really, really brilliant book, and thank you so much for writing it. It's one of those uh, rare books that has um, a genuinely uh, original and interesting argument, and it's one that I think feels both counterintuitive um, and compelling at the same time. So I'm really glad that we're having this discussion about it, and I'm sure there'll be many others as the book's read. Um, and I wanted to ask you, first of all, about the concept of uh, de juridification which I think is at the core of the book. Um, what does it mean? And I guess most importantly, how does de juridification distinguish itself from the sort of libertarian standpoint, the sort of people who want to abolish driving licenses uh, and, and things of that nature? Thanks, Nick. Well, well first of all, just before we get going, can I... Um start off by actually thanking a few people. This is um, the first launch for my book. It is the launch. It's not a launch. It's the launch. So um, I do actually, just for, if I can, just want to thank a few people at Repeater. This is probably the only formal chance I'll get to do. So if you don't mind, I will answer the question, but just very quickly. Um, I wanted to thank a whole bunch of people, actually. Um, Tarek Goddard, who commissioned the book, uh, Josh Turner and Matteo Mandari, who've been my editors. Um, Ellie Potts, Katie King, and above all, Christiana Spend, who've been working with me on marketing. Honestly, um, it has been an enormous pleasure working with Repeat. I've, I've written with a whole bunch of publishers before, but you know they've given me a lot of pleasure. It's, they've made the process fun in a way that it hasn't been with um, a bunch of other publishers for a while. So just first of all, thank you. All right, then on your question, Nick. Um, the, the word de-juridification is just negative, another word, juridification, and juridification is just a word coined by sociologists, what's well, horrible on words, I would love it if we had a simpler one, um, and it, it's just, it, all it means is basic idea that the law is coming deep, more deeply into people's lives, um, and that mean, and that might mean that, that new areas of law um, are coming into the law, so which were previously outside the law, like for example, um, anyone listening to this will know that we have things like the Data Protection Act, Freedom of Information Act. We have this new category of law, um, information law, which didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. And it also refers to a process by which, um, by which the law takes greater and greater control over the areas which are reserved to it. So if you want an example of that, an example of that would be something like um, um, an example, yeah. Um, we've just had a Tory Liberal Democrat coalition started a decade ago. One of the things which joined them together, both politicians said, we're going to reduce the number of criminal laws. There are too many criminal laws. We're going to shrink them down. One of the bad things about new Labour is it introduced far too many criminal penalties. And we'll get rid of them. In fact, they increased the number of crimes at the rate of one a day for every day they're in office. So juridification is just this word, which means the law is stretching and encompassing more and more things. Dejuridification, what you asked about, is just the term for the opposite. It's the notion that the law can shrink back. Now, um, when the right talks about dejuridification, they always find a really hideous way to do it. Like, like you get the example of libertarians and get rid of driving licenses. Um, but there's lots. You know, um, this year we may see the repeal of the Human Rights Act and its replacement with something which is intended to make it much harder to enforce human rights. Or you might think about fees from pump troubles or whatever. Um, my book is obviously, so I have to say these things, my book is obviously not trying to support any of that. But what I am saying is that for various reasons, um, the right has its, its, comp has its worked out and sophisticated program of pulling back the law. And actually the left used to have our own program of pulling back the law. You know, if you want some nice old men's beards um, to, to justify that, think of Marx and Engels and the idea of the withering away of the state. It used to be a really essential part of how left-wing people thought about the law. We wanted the state to have um, less influence over certain parts of people's lives. And that might be, for example, the criminal law. It might be we didn't want there to be laws criminalising people who were sleeping rough, whatever. The point is, I'm trying to say, we've lost the ability on the left to talk about shrinking the law and shrinking the law in a way that helps our causes and our people. Yeah, just, just to pick up on something you said quickly there, I think the Bill of um, the Human Rights Act repeal is a really interesting example because it's it's been called the Bill of Rights, um, 
which is sort of the opposite of what it is, right? It's 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 the shrinking of it's the shrinking of our rights rather than the, the codification of them. So in a way it's similar and in a way it's opposite to the example he gave of the coalition government because it's saying one thing and doing another. It's saying we're going to give you rights. In fact, it's in fact it's um it's shrinking them. I think it's you know it's an irony. Um the way I sort of understood the theme of the book was about laws and the state more broadly being fewer but better. And yeah. I guess the question is, better laws might achieve what? Is it justice or is it better material conditions or is it uh, more working class control and participation in how the state works? Or is it creating conditions for the overcoming of a capitalist society or a mix of all of those? Um, short answer, a mix of all of them. Um, I think if, if you're, if you try and deal with it concretely, um, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to, to, to express in just one book, um, what I see is, is the common shared strategic, um, problem faced by a whole series of different social movements. And those social movements might be tenants rights movements, they might be workers rights movements, it might be the movement just to, you know, protect the rights of nature. Now, one of the things which I'm I'm very clear on, maybe clearer now having written a book than I was when I started it, is that how exactly each of them will go about um, de-juridification in the ideal way is actually quite different. You know, for example, if you're the tenants' rights movement, probably the key legal reform it seems to me right now is a process of, of literally just the simplification of law. It's incredibly hard. We both know we both work in housing law. It's incredibly hard to say to someone, you've got the right to stay on your property. You don't. Your landlord wants you to leave. We have to begin by, by process like saying, well, what kind of tenancy are you? And we have this extraordinary proliferation of different legal statuses. Um, whatever. I could list them. It'd be boring. But, you know, there are, there's, there's over a dozen. Um, therefore, the challenge there is about simplification of law. It seems to me that for, for, for the workers' movement right now, the, the challenge is to come up with reforms which are all about increasing the social power of labour and which are therefore probably about vacating the law, taking the law out of the situation. So they're about things like, um, you know, just literally a really simple example, repealing the anti-union laws, making it possible for workers to go on strike. That's huge and terrible apparatus relating to balloting, enabling secondary strike action again. Um, so it's about reversing series of malign reforms from the 80s. If you're going to say, say in the same context, include environmental law, then the stakes are much higher because we were talking about, you know, will there still be people alive in 100 years' time? So the stakes are as high as they could possibly be. Um, here, actually, the, the extraordinary thing is we have this environmental law, but the, the, the key features of it are, number one, um, an ordinary citizen has almost no means to, to act on it. So if um, a private business is um, producing vast amount of old BP and they're, they're contributing to burning the planet at this incredibly fast rate, you as a citizen have no legal redress against them. You might have redress kind of at second hand through the government, but there's nothing you can do to sue BP for the slow um, death of the planet. You just can't, there aren't those mechanisms. So it kind of seems to me that with environmental law, the, the, the answer would probably be actually, and maybe this is something I'm clear in my head, having written about it when I wrote it, but probably you'd have to go through some process of building up the law in order to create the conditions where you don't need the law anymore. So, you know, it might be about saying we want laws so we can expropriate the polluters. And only then, once you've had them, and we're not worried about global warming anymore, you then in a moment, we're actually going to start then talking about, okay, this, this task is achieved. Now we can shrink that kind of law right back. Yeah, I'm really keen to talk about the environmental example because of its urgency. And I think probably if we circle back to it at the end when we've got a better grounding in it, that's a good kind yeah, of yeah. Uh, a good way of understanding everything that's gone before. Um, I think what you were talking about there about the ambition in in that particular example of labour rights of increasing the social power of labour by taking the law out of the situation, it is probably the answer to to my question because in a way it's totally opposite but very similar to the red tape challenge that we saw about 10 years ago, um, which led to things like the Grenfell fire, because they're doing a very similar thing. They're taking the law out of the situation, but their underlying project was to increase the power of capital and economic actors. Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, going back to where we started from de-juridification, the short answer 
is that neither more nor less law is actually what the less law works with or, or, or its allies need. You don't need more law, you don't need less law. It's kind of a, a fallacy. All our politics is based around this, this notion. Essentially, the orthodox parliamentary right presents itself as about shrinking the law. The orthodox parliamentary left in Europe and, and elsewhere in the rich world presents itself as about growing the world. But actually, neither growing nor shrinking the law is really in the interest of justice. We use that as a kind of shorthand for, for the cause of all these movements. What matters is having laws which actually solve a social problem. And the social problem might be the weak bargaining power of someone you want to win a conflict. OK, so so, yes, at times the right has de it as a strategy to help its people. And right now, say the workers movement, we need that the other way around. We need to de in order to help our people. Yeah, you say it's not about more law or less law, but, but but what it actually does. But one of the really striking things about the book was the statistic you give about the rate at which laws are written is faster than anyone can actually read. So if you if the only thing you did was read all the laws, you would have an ever growing backlog. I mean, that's got to be a problem, right? Yeah, I mean, but one way to think about it, which I talk about in the book, I mean, maybe one way which I talk about in the book, one way I've been thinking about it since. Um, in the book, I, I try and and stick together every instance I could find of the senior judiciary complaining about the complexity of the law. And where this has really happened is in immigration law. And you just find dozens and dozens of senior judges going, I don't understand the law. I need to look at this stuff for days and days and days before I can work out what it means. And if they're the people at the pinnacle system, they can't understand the law, where does that leave everyone else? And now, maybe to sort of take your point, and I hope, I'm hoping this will strike a chord with some people listening. Um, this isn't in the book, but it's just me trying to express it as practically as I can, yeah? Um, think about your own situations in work or, or in housing. If, if you've got an employment contract, how many people listening to this know what's in their employment contract? How many people, if you're a tenant, know what's in your, um, your tenancy contract? How many people reading this um, have a sense and could say, all right, I know there are things which should be in either of those agreements, but aren't? Like, for example, maybe I've got a right um, to um, have for my property to be in, kept in repair. Well, I might know that right exists, whether it's in the written agreement or not. All right. So now think about these written agreements. How many people could name in employment, it might be 70 or 80, these 70 or 80 rights and obligations you have, which aren't in your employment contract, but everyone expects you to be bound by. Now, do the same mechanism for housing law. And housing law, it's a little bit simpler, but it's still... How many people know what's missing from their tenancy agreements? And then you could go on from that. Um, if that's, if, even if there are people, you know, I'm hoping Nick and I will go say, oh, you know, we, you know, we do housing and employment law, or we do discrimination in housing law. So we, we're pretty up with things. We might go to most of them. All right, well, for us, could we tell you um, the last time you looked at an insurance contract which you've signed? Whether it had whether it was with compatible with all the rights you're entitled to under consumer protection law, or last time you logged onto a website and it gave away all your data and enabled the company to sell it. Was that process, if nothing else, was that process in compliance with what the law is supposed to be? And you only have to go through that kind of checking process a few times. And I suspect more or less everyone listening to this will be saying, All right, well, maybe I could do one of those processes. <laughs> you know, maybe I do actually know it's in my employment contract. So I actually checked it, you know. But very, very few people, I couldn't go through all of those and say, right, these are actually the rights of laws. Now, that has an impact on democracy. If we're all going along to election time and the parties come along to us and give us a series of proposals to change law, and we base our votes around their programmes, around what we think they will do in government, both what they say they'll do, what we think they'll actually do, and we say, um, right, we trust you because you've promised to do X, well, what if we don't even have a clue individually as voters what that X means? What if we have no idea whatsoever um, how far that proposed legal change actually changes things in our interests or against our interests? So we might have an idea, but we might have heavily distorted and ideologized view. So what I'm really trying to give people a sense of in the book is that that's really, really bad for democracy. It's not all of, it's not main of, but it's part of why you've got in all our societies people raging, feeling powerless, getting paranoid and getting angry. Part of why that's happening is because we're all bound to each other by these invisible sets of relationships 
which each of us individually has has feels that we contributed less and less to making and has less and less of a sense of what they've actually produced. Um, one of the reasons why the right's been winning politically around the world in the last 10, 15 years is because at least to some extent they started talking about the problem. The left never talks about that problem. We just go, well, laws are good. We're Mr. Lawful Keir Starmer. What we never do is actually say part of our programme needs to be about reducing a very large number of malign laws. Yeah, I think that's critical. I think that's what comes out of the book is that the left has a problem with not really knowing what to do about the state. I mean, for the right, it's obvious the state is there to protect capital and private property. For the left, the state sometimes gives us nice things and things that we need. It sometimes locks us up for protesting and we have quite a difficult time working out what our response to the state should be and, and the book's great for teasing yeah. that out. Um, for those, well, no one's read it yet because it's only just been released, but for those who haven't read it, the book's split into three parts. There's a, a part about neoliberalism and, and what's been taking part over the last 40 years to get us into this situation to begin with. The second part's about the populism that we've been seeing in more recent years and, and how that's topped up that process. And the third point's about um, de juridification on, on, as a left-wing programme and what we touched on at the start. So I'm going to start with the neoliberalism bit, um, if that's all right. And what the book does is give a sort of zoomed out history of what neoliberalism did to the way our rights work, this sort of pattern of neoliberalism not taking away any legal rights exactly, but making old rights um, less accessible uh, and ensuring that it's, it's the poorest who suffer in the outcomes and the sort of slow replacement um, rather than a sharp shock. And emblematic of this, you have um, the uh, description of employment rights and the individual claimant replacing the trade union as the sort of focal point for, for disputes. Um, do you want to just tell us about how profoundly that method um, has changed things? Sure. And, and again, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to come on maybe to climate change within yeah. us because part of, what neoliberal, part of how neoliberalism works is about constantly creating markets and things which shouldn't be markets. And it's have incredibly destructive consequences. But... but um, in terms of at least of solving the problem, um, employment law runs through the book as, as, as something, you know, because going back to it, you know, I'm a Marxist, I want, you know, labour to win against capital. <laughs> so for me, understanding that seems to be quite central to a whole bunch of other things. And, and again, say it works in a slightly different way. Um, the moment at which we have individual employment law in Britain, you can date, it's really precise, it's 1972. Um, and it comes about all of a sudden, um, um, under Teddy, so before neoliberalism, you get um, an, an, an industrial tribunal set up as part of um, um, a bill which, which is all about taking away workers' rights. So, for example, it introduces compulsory certification registration for trade unions. If trade unions then go on strike, contrary to registration, then there are all sorts of new criminal penalties, members involved in criminal jail. And this leads to um, probably the most political um, strike wave in British history with um, thousands of workers downing tools in opposition to a particular bill. And, and this, you know, the famous moments in this are the Pentonville Dockers strike, etc. And, and it's all these mass strikes, which is probably the high tide of combativity on the part of the British working class in 1972. It wasn't principally against tribunals, but tribunals were part of the picture of the things which people were resisting. They just, people just sensed that if workers um, were told the way that you can save your job isn't through joining the trade union, isn't through working together in the trade union, isn't through holding the threat of strike over the employer, but by litigating, that this would inevitably have some consequence in terms of massively taking rights away um, from workers, uh, which, is, which is counterintuitive because you go, oh, you know, all, the, all these workers gained rights, surely. They gained the right to come so What all these strange trade unionists do, being madly against something which is an extra thing which their members can do. It doesn't take away anything, it only adds something. But the thing it adds isn't a gift at all. It's, it becomes, over the next 50 years, a disaster um, for trade unionists. For a long time, workers largely opt out of the system, and that changes in the 1980s under the impact of a couple of things. And they're kind of obvious, you think about them. Um, they have mass unemployment, they're the defeat of set piece strikes, the steel workers, the miners, and so on. And they're um, the anti union laws and sequestration of union funds. All this creates a dynamic where people are still facing the situation. They're still um, workers who are now um, threatened of losing their jobs. They say, all right, if, if the right to go on strike has been taken away from me, at least I'm not powerless, at least I can litigate individually. 
and, and this is incredibly dis this has been incredibly disempowering for workers' movements in all sorts of long-term ways. Um, and uh, just to sort of talk about two or three of them. Firstly, it's incredibly costly. If you as a union market yourself to your members, as many do, by saying anyone who gets sacked will, will put your case for a lawyer and they, they might represent you in a tribunal, this is diverting an enormous chunk of the union's total resources. Another problem with them is that the rewards which people are allowed under the law are way worse than the rewards people used to get beforehand. So, you know, I've done some digging. If you looked at whether people lost their jobs in, their, in the 60s would get them back, essentially, they said, I'm unhappy, complained to the internally about being sat. Chances are about 30 to 40% of the time they'd get their job back. Right now, if you bring an unfair dismissal claim, the chances at the end of that claim of both winning it and getting reinstatement are a bit less than one in a thousand. So the odds are terrible, it costs a fortune, and it's really demoralising for the fabric of unions because lots of trade unions spend their time, this includes people I love, people who instruct me, I'm not criticising them I'm doing it. You have to do it. People train themselves in the workplace to, to do casework, to become individual litigators, try desperately to keep up with all the changes in employment law. They have to in order to provide a kind of frontline service to their fellow members losing a job. But that's a vast sucking out resources out of the trade union movement away from collectivization, away from doing things together towards um, here's an individual, if they win their case, they win it by finding a lawyer early and the lawyer advised and the lawyer is expertise. The expertise is all outside, it's not within the union movement. So it's all had a really significant effect in terms of disempowering work. So that's kind of, for me, almost the purest simple example of how this seeming increase of rights um, which really accelerated under neoliberalism, has in fact rendered social movements powerless. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting what you were saying that, about how workers just sensed it, because of course they were absolutely right. Um, and it goes back to what we were saying at the start about de being both counterintuitive and very, very persuasive at the same time. Um, one of the other things you mentioned importantly in the neoliberal, um, the neoliberalism section is the law as a means of disempowering and uh, disciplining the working class. Um, and you mentioned in particular this sudden spike in the number of criminal offences and quasi-criminal offences under the Blair government. Uh, and then, of course, as you mentioned, the, the, the coalition's stated ambition was to get rid of that, but in fact they made it worse. And I think possibly one of the most interesting examples of this is housing, because the abolition of secure tenancies took place very, very shortly after the miners' strike. Um, and it seems to me that we haven't really talked about whether that was connected to the idea that you can defeat a movement so much more easily if it doesn't have any anywhere secure to live. And then when you add on to that, what we saw in more recent times with the addition of um, essentially policing powers for social landlords, that they're now mainly responsible for applying for antisocial behaviour injunctions um, and, 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 and closure orders and things like that. Um, and I just wondered, it's not specifically in the book, but what your view is on the connection between housing law as a means of dis disciplining in that hierarchy and neoliberal way. I think that's right. Um, and I think, for example, you think about right to buy, that, that would be yet another example of how seemingly giving people a right actually leaves everyone powerless because it's taken away two thirds of um, local authority homes. It's rendered, you know, half the local authorities in Britain now have no stock of their own. And that's been a disaster in terms of, of workers. The only thing I'd say is, is that I think one thing I do talk in my book, we'll talk about in my book, which does com complicate that to some extent, is that, of course, there's also this kind of funny counterintuitive process under which neoliberalism does actually have a project of disempowering everybody, but the people leading it know you can't attack everybody all at once. So, you know, the Tories come to power with this plan to split off the um, industries, including mining, to fight them all and set these battles and defeat them. It's actually five years before they feel confident enough to act on the original plan. Or, or another example is, um, you know, everyone might be familiar with in lots of public sector um, organisations, you get pension reforms. But it's never as simple as just like one day everyone's got the best gold plated pension and the next day they've got nothing. What you get is this kind of salami slicing away of rights and some people left in slightly protected categories and they're, they're almost the only people who've got the social power so they could resist it. And they have to resist it in the name of um, generations who aren't in that situation yet. But again, I'm old enough, so another example of that for, my, for people of my age might be something like when student 
um, fees came in, how the people who had to fight them were, were the people with students then, because they didn't face fees immediately. The fees were going to come in in five years' time. So you get this constant slicing off of little groups of people. And in theory, the old right remains. So I, I have to, I'm not totally sure if it was as simple as, as like 1988 was a strategy to get the miners, because the miners, given where they were, were quite likely to be homeowners, were relatively likely to be one of the more secure groups of workers. It, it, it feels to me that 1988 was more like um, we, we defeated this main major antagonist, and that's cleared the ground to attack generations of people to come into the future. I think it's more like that than it is, than it is exactly like, um, well, you know, we've beaten one set of core industrial workers, let's get the next core industrial set of workers. It, it, it's more this kind of long-term focus. This, this thing, which, again, the left never seems to be able to do. <laughs> you know, you do get left-wing governments in Britain or America, like in America, Democrats have won, was it like, um, all but one or two of the popular votes in the last presidential elections. But what you never get is someone strategizing in power on behalf of the left, saying, right, you know, we're going to aim to win certain things and we're content to achieve this victory one, which creates conditions for victory two, so we have victory three. Even when we get a few reforms passed by our side, they're always piecemeal and there's never that ambition that, that goes, all right, we're going to, you know, we're going to change the population, make everyone our voters, guarantee ourselves large social democratic majorities and bit by bit take everything. In the greatest periods of, of left-wing self-confidence, we never seem to think like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and possibly we might come back to this in the populism bit, because what you seem to have now with that salami slicing process is uh, two generations that confront each other between the people who are retiring now and their children with the salami slicing having taken place in the middle. So one of them has got excellent pensions and secure housing. One of them has been through hell. And that's a real social problem, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the temptation is for the people at the, at the bottom who are going, well, we're very young, we've got no rights to blame the old voters. But that's suicide is an approach it's yeah. not the fault of other voters it's the fault of the politicians it's the fault of the capitalists whatever but it's not the fault of other voters yeah 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 um but but let's come on to populism because i think this is a really really important part of the book because i think uh, most can of I, us can here, I, can i can i just on, can I, before we do actually can i because mm. I, I i did want to say something in the neoliberalism section mm. about the environment because it's actually something i slightly cut out of the book but i think it, it's important towards seeing the argument in its totality um both in the neoliberalism and populism sections, I'm talking about this dynamic under which people come to, came to power 40 years ago, they've come to power in the last five years, promising to reduce law, but have actually um, increased it. And I think one of the, um, obviously under neoliberalism, one of the main forms of this took, why you had this imperative to, 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 to bigger and bigger the law, as they put it in the law, in the law acts, when, when bigger, one of the ways in which that happens, which to my mind, I'm hoping readers and listeners here in this will get what I'm talking about, one of the really good illustrations of that is what's happened with this notion of tradable carbon emissions. Is that in Europe and therefore in Britain, because although we've left the EU, we've kept this in Britain, we've mirrored the scheme here. You have this idea that we must have a market in tradable carbon emissions. The only way we can actually reduce carbon is to say to all the companies in the world, all right, You've got, a bar, you've got a budget on how much carbon you can produce um, each year, and we're going to 1%, 2%, 3%. It's an incredibly glacially slow rate. Encourage you to reduce your carbon, not give you enough budget to, to keep on expanding or, or, or penalise penalize you financially if you do it. And this is actually the European Union and the Britons and Britain's main single strategy for dealing with climate change. So you create a market in these tradable excess of overproduced carbon. Now, this has had incredibly destructive consequences for the environment, one of which is perversely, it's massively incentivized, for example, um, um, certain sectors like, um, um, like construction and concrete. We've vastly increased the amount of concrete we produce because all these companies went, oh, we've got carbon budgets under which we can increase the amount of carbon we produce by 4%. Mm, we'd better massively expand while the opportunity is there. And, and there's been this really ludicrous idea that having these regulated markets would solve the problem of carbon emissions on a meaningful and useful time. And it's done the exact opposite. And I, I just thought it might be by putting that in just there, because I imagine we're going to come back to environment, but it's neoliberalism which set up that idea. 
the, the laws which will do it with laws which have to operate in terms of creating this horrible market and things you buy and sell and something which doesn't need to be a market and it's a disaster that it's been treated like that. Yeah, no, that's really sharp. And the point as well about uh, carbon footprints and making us personal consumers in that exactly. market and, and regulating ourselves yeah. in that respect. Um, the, the populism bit, I think, is, is, is really useful because um, most of us have probably uh, thought about the emergence of neoliberalism before. But what you're writing in this middle section of the book is really sort of happening um, right before our eyes. And I think one of the provocative bits in the book is you draw something of a bright line between two distinct phases of history, neoliberalism and populism. And I wanted to challenge you a bit on whether one is a continuation of the other or whether there yeah. really is a separation between them. Yeah, look, I'm, look, I'm not, I'm not at all sure whether whether actually um, people can look back in twentieth or in thirties time and see this as kind of populism, something distinct from neoliberalism, or, or just another kind of like extension of it, an intensification of it. Because obviously, even within neoliberalism, there were things that you know there was the kind of nationalism, etc., etc., etc. And and I think some of it. Some of it is really dependent on political events. You know, why, why was neoliberalism able to break through? Because you had huge election victories for neoliberal politicians in Britain first and then America. And they were, with, with that wind behind them, they were able to take the world. What happened um, with the kind of populism breakthrough in, in 2016? We had Brexit, we had the Trump victory. But five years later, or right now, the two main politicians associated with that breakthrough, Trump and in Britain, probably Boris Johnson, are actually out of office. So, you know, when you look at the um, when you look at the politicians who are now set to replace Boris Johnson in Britain, frankly, they look much more like continuity neoliberals than they do like con continuity populists. So, I mean, it may be that actually you're right when we come back in the future to, to see um, see continuity rather than the break. But I, I just again, I think that it's it's dependent on a whole set of process which this time we just really don't know like who's going to win the american election in another two years time you know yeah 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 no absolutely and and, and at, at the moment it looks well it looks in the in the white house like continuity in the supreme court um I, i'd be interested yeah. to hear your thoughts um yeah exactly it's it's tr the one the one thing trump actually achieved as a as a sort of as a technician of authoritarian government was the, super, the Republican supermajority in the Supreme Court. He did not achieve um, along the Mexican wall. He did not achieve more deportations. Um, he did achieve as well um, a Muslim travel ban. But again, you know, th there wasn't the kind of transformation of, of American immigration or in the right wing direction. There wasn't the transformation of policing. In, in, and, and, you know, for a time, all of us were able to say to ourselves, oh, well, you know, the populists are terrible, but at least they're bloody incompetent in government. Um, but I don't know if that would feel the same if you were... I mean, that's maybe how things feel in Brazil. I don't think it's how things feel if you're in Hungary or if, or if you're in India. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about the similarities between the politics of Germany uh, in the early 20th century and the, and the populism of today? OK, I'll try and do this super fast. Um, when I was writing about populism in the book, I wanted to talk about it as in a political science way, because through the book I do that, I talk about neoliberalism, go back to their ideas, and we get on to the left. I start with the left's ideas before I get on to what people, what that means, you know, programmatically. Um, I was trying to, to find a generation of thinkers in world history who best explain the populism we've got now, and it didn't seem to me any of them. You know, none of them are great writers, none of them have, have, have jotted down a manifesto, and yet you see these consistent styles of politics. Like, for example, the idea of trashing the institutional, um, multinational institutions that, that post-date the Second World War. That was a major thing for Trump. It's been a major thing in Britain. There's no coherent explanation of it, but it's not coincidence that people are doing that at the same time. And that, for example, makes them different from the neoliberals. So what what ultimately seemed to me to explain what was going on best was looking at a generation of writers who are very, very coherent about what they're doing, and I think argued for quite similar things. And the people I fixed on are Weber in Germany and Karl Schmidt. Now, Weber's often seen as quite a centre ground, even liberal figure, but, but in his last few years, he'd actually made a big shift towards justifying authoritarianism and leaving things in the German constitution which helped draft, which 
in many ways paved the way for Hitler. But, but he's a kind of liberal moving right. He's not a conservative. He's not a far-right conservative. Schmidt is both of those things. He's someone who's far-right conservative, the key jurist for the authoritarian turn in Germany, and later the um, major jurist for the Nazi regime. Um, and both of them, in different ways, try and uh, um, set out a programme for, for what happens when ministers, the executive, grab power into their hands at, at the hands of other parts of the um, of the kind of traditional separation power, so at the hands of um, away from parliament, away from the legal sphere. And that, it seems to me, is exactly what's been happening under populists in both Britain and America, that sense of ministers grabbing power into their own hands and taking it away from other democratic institutions. And I think actually is something which, again, on the far left, we're quite lies to we sort of let that pass it doesn't seem to us what would be the most essential thing but but you know again if you can if the result where that gets you is somewhere like hungary it can leave you in a situation where, where in practice ordinary politics becomes impossible now obviously we haven't reached that point in britain but equally a whole bunch of quite troubling things happened and were happening here in very similar ways um have been happening in very similar ways to where they didn't happen elsewhere in the world yeah, that was one of the things I found really, really shocking in the book was when you set out the scale of the transfer of power from Parliament to um, to the executive, both under the EU um, legislation and under the the, the COVID uh, emergency legislation. It, as a practicing lawyer, it it, it 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 almost completely passed me by, and it really is a very fundamental remaking of the British state, isn't it? Yeah, and, and look again. I, I can only really talk about this in legal terms, so apologies if this is a slight turn off for any non lawyers listening, but it really is extraordinary. If you look at those Brexit bills one after the other, they just fall of section after section, which reads, ministers can do what they like. And it just happened again and again and again. Brexit became this, this sort of complete device by which ministers could basically rewrite any statute on that they liked. And, um, you know, again, it's kind of we quite look far into the question. I want to leave time for the last third of the book, but it is quite an important part of what I'm arguing. And I think that 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 I hope readers enjoy it because it, it hopefully it will kind of perhaps make sense of what we've just been witnessing the last few weeks with the fall of Boris Johnson. Because essentially, what happened is ministers were given. Um, it didn't just happen under COVID, but COVID was the most intense form of it. This complete power to rewrite the laws as they like. But they turn out to be incredibly bad at it, just in terms of at the administrative task of making laws. That you get laws being rewritten once a week, practically, and to an extent, to, and the ministers themselves barely had a clue what was what was written in them. Now you actually see that with Boris Johnson himself, going, you know, well, you know, I didn't breach COVID by cycling um, outside my local area when I was only seven miles away. Of course he did. I didn't breach, I didn't, and the I didn't breach gets less and less coherent and plausible the longer he stays in office. But, but there's this kind of almost sort of classical Greek democracy cycle of the, the, the populist imaginary. We could seize all this power for ministers. We could create the Dominic Cummings version of, of, a, of a government untrammeled by boring, slow parliament. What it actually creates is this mass of laws, which they all get trapped in. None of them think for a second they might be subject to laws, and they find they are subject to their own laws, and they find their laws contemptible. Um, but that's not, that's why I said it's like a Greek tragedy. It's kind of the, the the hubris of this of this process is extraordinary, and obviously it's shaping domestic politics as we speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a reminder to please put any more questions in the Q and A as we move on to the last third of the book. And I wanted to come on to look at uh, what's sometimes called cause lawyering. Uh, and we saw this, for example, through the Brexit litigation and through public interest claims. And, and we'll maybe look in a minute at the, at the problems and critiques, but I'm quite interested in where you think this, this, this idea of litigation as a political act has emerged from, and whether you think it was a reaction to the phases of neoliberalism and populism that you set out in the first two thirds. I think it's definitely that, that you know, popular, neoliberalism or populism, they can create conditions, but it's very hard for social movements to organise. You know, for example, we could have um, the new police bill that's supposed to be introduced this year, which means that if someone's been on two protests in five years, they can be subject to civil order, banning them from going on further protests, ordering them to live somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're giving effectively anti-terror powers to policemen to use against people whose only thing they've done is to go on two demos. 
And that is extraordinary and grotesque. And what that means, what it can mean potentially, what those powers are used, has a chilling effect, people don't protest, etc. But that doesn't mean all their anger, all their frustration of society disappears. So neoliberalism, it reduces all to these individual subjects in relation to the market, but people still want to organize, still want to achieve social change. So for example, um, um, even when they protest, their protests often become about war, and I talk about that as a problem in terms of the anti-war movement of the early 2000s. But, but speeding that up and get to what's going on now, um, you know, we used to talk about um, clicktivism as a phenomenon. Clicktivism now seems to take the form of people spending um, money by donating to crowdfunders through which you can judicially review, review the government in order to achieve some socially desirable end. Let's say, for example, stop the introduction of the, or the bedroom tax or whatever. Um, but it, it, it's a response to neoliberalism, but it retains, even if you talk about the, the, the first initial critique of it, and we'll come on to practical problems of it, it retains from neoliberalism the idea that we are essentially atomized, isolated individuals who cannot be formed into classes, who can only be bound together in these very temporary passing coalitions of interest which disappear again. And, and it's really, really not any sort of route. You know, if it's, you know, crowds versus crowdfunding, then stay in the crowds. The crowds have so much more social power. Yeah, and there's a line I want to read out because I found it so important and humbling. Um, it says, juridification teaches the participants in social movements that change must come through the work of others. It is the task of lawyers fighting courtroom battles rather than of the people themselves. And this is a really crucial point about centering the roles of lawyers in what should be political struggles. And there was a really, what I thought was an interesting example of this in PMQs last week, when Keir Starmer stood up and he said, when I was prosecuting um, sex offenders at the CPS, now obviously that never actually happened, but he somehow changed it from the institution of the CPS doing something to his own act as a lawyer being yeah. a political act that defines him. Um, do, you, yeah. do you think that goes further than the arguments you, you mentioned in the book, or do you think that's characteristic of the kind of centering of lawyers in politics that we've become used to seeing? Look, I, I, I just think it's a further elaboration of something that was already going in a pretty negative direction. And, and, you know, in writing this stuff, um, you know, some, I am partly re reflecting on my own um, activist experience. And again, that, that's always something you should be kind of cautious about as a writer. You should never go, right, the, this is the world I see in front of me, so therefore this is what it's like for everybody. That, that's a really stupid way. You can completely mislead yourself if you write like that. But I'm intensely conscious, you know, I start off as being an activist and anti-fascist and left-wing causes. I then become a trade unionist. I then become a trade union official. I then become a barrister representing trade unions. Um, I try to keep the, the memory of the training I received early on in those causes of saying, you always want to recenter the rank of our workers in a workplace. But what I'm talking about is how bloody impossible it is to do that. Um, if what's happened is the individual dispute which the, which the workers want to, to be acknowledged in the courts has gone through all the filtering mechanisms from the workplace, the original official, the union lawyer, to the barrister, to the tribunal, each stage becomes harder and harder for ordinary activists to control. Um, and, and that seems to me a, a phenomenon that, that's much more widespread than that. You know, I've seen again and again how, how good causes how destructive it is once you start to run and say, right, we could do a petition, we could occupy the town hall, or we could think about getting a judicial review. And the moment that, that judicial review becomes a credible way for the campaign to go, how it changes the content and nature of the campaign and changes who you're working with, how you're, 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 you're seeing the, the, the problem of prizing open a bad decision made by power. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think, We've also been a little bit misled by the past sort of 10, 15 years when it became really important to challenge the government's austerity programme. And we did see some wins in that. Uh, and the Supreme Court was a sort of option of last resort for us, which had traditionally never been the case for the left before. The judges were, were not our friends. I wonder if you feel the sands shifting a bit at the moment. In terms yeah, definitely. Of no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there was a really good article in The Guardian um, about 10 days ago, which was just literally counting of high court cases, permission grant for judicial review, where was it going in terms of people being granted permission or not? And there's been a 50% shrink over the last two years. It's, it's really easy to see why that's happened, because the government said, 
um, keep on using judicial review against us and we'll take away judicial review. You had the first signed up with the first Judicial Review Act, and you've had changes of personnel in the Supreme Court. Uh, Baroness Hale, who came from a very particular background, had been a, um, a lecturer for many years before she was a lawyer, which is very unusual amongst the senior judiciary, had been very committed to the most social justice areas of law, and the cohort of lawyers who've replaced her largely through natural wastage. Some of this is quite random, but it's happened. Having people who come from backgrounds in commercial and private law, the things which matter to them are narrow, and they've got absolutely no um, interest whatsoever in, in giving a, a V sign to the government. Now, that doesn't mean that, that, that we've gone from a situation where things could or would win to where they can't win. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. In any legal dispute, there are only going to be two outcomes, a good one or a bad one. So, so you never lose a chance of winning entirely. But there's definitely been a phenomenon of just uh, between the government doing it, between the, the judges policing themselves, of that closing down. And, and frankly, at any moment when you start seeing um, a series of victories for radical movements in the courts, you can expect something like that process will emerge. This isn't a train that's favourable to us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I said I'd get back to the environment, uh, which I will. Um, I think the core of the book is, is the idea that we should prior, uh, prioritise not an increase in our legal rights, but greater social power uh, outside the yeah. law. And I just want to test this a bit because the, the final bit of the book is a challenge to, to environmental champions um, as a sort of analogue for, for politics everywhere. And the question is, do we build up an edifice of laws to protect the planet, or do we reject that as reformism and work towards a post-capitalist alternative? So if, if the government were to say to you, look, we're going to set up an environmental tribunal, we'll get the Lorax yeah. on the panel, we'll write some brilliant new laws, would you say yes or no? <laughs> um... I, I, I don't know. I really don't. Um, I would think about that really hard. And I think the fact that even I don't know the answer might be part of the reason why it's not happened. Because, you know, you and I both know people who are in that generation of lefty lawyers who are focusing on the environment, who make that their, their main focus of interest. And my sense when I talked to them, because when I wrote the book, I did talk to them. You know, one of the most exciting things that's happened to me since the book came out is I know that... Um, lawyers within Greenpeace have read the book and have been discussing its contents. Um, I don't think from within the environmental movement or particularly from the, within the legal wing of the environmental movement, there's any clear answer to that question. And I think that essentially lawyers, intuitively or not, grasp the same ultimate inability to answer it that I've got, which is, and it, this is the dilemma we're all facing. Um, Carbon sticks around in the environment a very, very long time. Um, a proportion of the CO2 we burn now will still be burnt. This will be adding to global warming in 100,000 years' time. So we really, really have a bank of how much carbon we can use up. If you just look at the, pro at the property rights of the, the six or seven largest oil companies, as I understand it, they've already claimed property over enough stored oil and gas. If they burnt it all, the world would miss 1.5 indeed two degrees, seven times over. So the only way we're going to stop global warming at the point which we've all agreed we will, amongst other things, is by turning around to large owners of the, of the oil and gas companies and saying, the large majority of the carbon you already control, you already have a property interest in, you're not going to be allowed to burn. Uh, and then, then then immediately pose the question, is this going to be like, you know, either we're all going to burn to death or you're going to have a process a bit like, say, um, the abolition of the slave trade, when you're having to turn to these companies and either you can expropriate them without profit um, or you can turn around and say, all right, we can massively compensate. I don't particularly want to say massively compensate, but, you know, those are some of the options we're all going to face. Now, and, and again, we're doing this to people who don't have just all the wealth from all that oil and gas, but they get vast amounts of, of public subsidies each year. The world spends more on subsidising the oil companies each year than it spends on healthcare. So we're, we're talking about this major strategic enemy, which we barely even acknowledge, but we've got to confront. Otherwise, lots and lots and lots of people are going to die. So the two limbs of the dilemma. Limb number one is 
absent a social revolution transformation, there is no process in society which can achieve that transformation except through the law. So if you really do write a revolution, I hope you don't, but if we do, there's no other way of doing it than to some legal process of managing that expropriation. So number one, we have to have an area of law um, because otherwise we're all doomed, absent social revolution, of course. But that's the first limb of the dilemma. The second limb of the dilemma is, um, but we have no ability in law to achieve that. We have no legal concepts. We just have nothing. We've got things like nuisance. We've got the laws I've talked about, about the regulation of industry. They are useless in that task. Um, so the only thing we've got, and it's useless. Now, there's a solution for that, it seems to me, in terms of social revolution. Great. But, you know, I'm not, I haven't written this book so that it's only going to be read by social revolutionaries. I've written a book deliberately, which could be read by social revolutionaries, and they'll get something out of it, I hope. Or it could be read by very middle-of-the-road reformists, and they too are intended to get something out of the book. I'm not trying to solve the battle between warp reform and revolution in this book. But what I'm saying is if you write revolution out of it, then that question, do we have a tribunal, but the mechanism, the intellectual mechanism we've developed to work with would be completely inadequate to task. There isn't a solution to that at present. And even the inspiring green lawyers that I look to and to, to solve that problem, I don't believe have solved it either. So your question is, would I accept <laughs> an environmental yes or no? Um, I've not answered it, but I hope at least to explain why I can't answer it. But, but part of it is because it's not my job to answer it. It's a job of social movements to answer it, and social movements haven't answered, even in the most utopian way. Even, even if people just said, all right, we're going to come up with an idea, which is we're going to have a right of nature, and every single, every single company has got a right to manage property, and they can manage that property only so long as they're not misusing the natural resource. And at the moment they are, they're subject to punishments, the last of which is expropriation, yeah. We could come up with that. We could turn around and say, um, for every person in the world, they have the same right in nature that a parent has in their child. Because a parent's right in their child trumps property rights. It's one of the very few legal rights that does. Um, but no one, as far as I can see, saying that, arguing that, putting that down on paper, putting the wildest, most, most imaginative form, even knowing it wouldn't happen. No one's even putting down on paper the blueprint of what that would look like. And still that moment they would, how can you advocate for it? How can you start thinking seriously about evolving, of avoiding the mistakes that were made, say, with the employment tribunal, which was you created this thing which could have been quite good, and then you put judges in charge of it, and all the judges have been trained with all their common sense understandings going back to previous sorts of things, so they thought about how they'd neutralise it. How do we avoid that happening? And we haven't got, yeah. even got to the stage of imagining it till we work about saving it from disaster. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a premature question, but it's, it's fascinating uh, how vexed it is. And I think that to muddy the waters even further, um, we're talking there about a, a tension between prioritising increasing our legal rights and greater social power outside the law, but, but there are often times when they overlap. And if we think, for example, yeah. about housing and harking back to that, that insecurity that defines us now, if we were to campaign for greater social rights in housing, it would be easier to organise for social revolution and pretty much everything else. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, I mean, a lot of um, the exciting social movements um, we've seen even in the last few months in Britain, even in quite small scales, sometimes they take the form of, of, of in a sense, of de -juridification. The RMT strike, mm. these are people going for inflation pay rise. You cannot get an inflation pay rise with the law, so they're going outside the law. That's simple de -juridification. But ultimately, it's not the model or the only model. It's no more of a model than, say, the people who responded to the Rwanda flight, thought the Court of Appeal had said the flight was definitely going ahead, um, responded by occupying the road, blocking the streets, and actually, lo and behold, the Court of Appeal <laughs> reconvened, slaughtering that, you know, pretty Patel's, blaming her for the trouble and finding a legal solution. Um, if you create the conditions for a return to the streets, actually sometimes they achieve legal victories and I'm really not writing those off. I'm just yeah. saying they come about, get the, get the sequence right in terms of what creates what. It's not the laws which create the movement, it's the movements which create the laws.
yeah, I think it's right to, to, to emphasize that the book isn't 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 slagging off our colleagues who do fantastic work day in yeah. day out. Um, it, it, it's deeper than that. David, it's such a rich book. Um, we've only scratched the surface, but we ought to move on to Q and A. I just wanted to check with you whether there was anything big I've missed before we do that. No, no, not at all. I'd be really happy to to if, if people do have any questions to respond to them. That would just that'd suit me. Yeah, I'm going to read them out if that's okay. Our first one's from Daniela. Uh, and she says, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Looking forward to reading the book. To what extent do you think the problems you've raised, particularly in relation to the problems faced by unions post-1972, uh, related to the nature of liberal rights themselves? Feminist legal scholars and many others have often linked some of the problems you cite with the individualistic nature of liberal rights, in addition to the impracticalities of using mitigation to have rights protected. Also, is there, is there not a problem of too much but not enough law regulating the executive in the UK? Um, yes, totally to both. I mean, you know, um, I mean, among, um, in the concluding third of the book, I, I talk about some of the people who've influenced me. Um, some of them are arguments within feminism. Some of them are arguments within um, um, critical race theory. Some of them are arguments, um, for example, from um, the um, the um, disability movement. Some of them, are, uh, I, I found a bunch of trans authors really excited confronting exactly this problem because their movement is all lined up towards achieving an immediate and visible um, social right, the, the recognition of trans people and the gender of their choice, perhaps by gender, self-ID or whatever. Um, so, so everything is set up towards this obvious main target and yet loads of people are writing and can see um, actually um, A, that's not happening and B, actually would it be the goal when what what when when what people need is um actually a whole series as well a whole series of social rights access to healthcare above all um and so i think that it i think for those writers they're incredibly influenced by the same feminist tradition which daniela is talking about so maybe i think overall i kind of i got those ideas in there in the book but i think i got them through through the kind of slightly that was how the route to which i got them and in terms of controlling exactly too much, but not enough law, yeah, I mean, that, I thought that was lovely. I mean, the whole irony is, is that for a very, very long time, the supposed brilliance and genius of the law is its quality. It doesn't just bind people below, it also um, binds people above. And what we've seen in, in the last six months, clearly, is its immense desire on, on the parts of all sorts of people to break that up and to have only punitive laws to look downwards and not have any sense of reciprocal obligation um, directed at people above. Yeah, and to wade in on that slightly, I think if, if we can call this a populist government, one of the things it's been defined by is its refusal to do things which it ought to do by convention because it thinks it's backed up by a massive democratic majority. You know, people refuse to resign until they really, really have to. There, there's nothing governing them except for what they think won't be tolerated by their voters. Yeah. Um, a question from our friend and comrade Declan Owens. He says, as you know, I practice in labour law and environmental law. I'm a big fan of the concept of de juridification and see huge synchronicities in the labour and environmental movements, especially with the rights of nature. Not yet read your book, but uh, uh, having received it this morning, but look forward to reading it, especially chapter nine. My question relates to the concept of the rule of law, which is a dubious concept in a capitalist society. Have you dealt with this in your book? What do you think about it? My view is that the reliance on the concept of the rule of law is presupposed on a valid rule of law, which is never actually manifested in capitalist societies. Hmm. Look, I, I really get where Dacton's coming from, and I, that's a fair question, and I like the idea. But I think, I know, I, I think that, and I think I'm influenced by that. I, I think that I'm, I'm, painfully aware of how easily the rich and powerful opt out. You know, the same way they opt out of the tax system, so equally they opt out of the legal system, or they try to. Um, but I kind of, but I think my understanding of the law tries to balance that with, with the kind of opposite thought, which goes like this. Um, one of the reasons why lots and lots of people are willing to put their trust in law is because law creates at least the pretense of a neutral system of arbitrary and social disputes. And we know it's not really a neutral system, we know it's really a loaded system, but it does at least give that pretense. And it does so, uh, it has to do so to some, in order to be successful, 
in order to be successful, it has to give the impression that, it, that at least the participants are playing by the same set of rules and that it um, and that, that that supposedly level playing field will actually be maintained and respected. So, so the whole history of of the law and its relation to, to social movements seem to me is a constant zigzagging between the rich looking to escape from it, but then actually then turning back to it, um, depending on the um, depending on the situation they're in. Um, and, and to try and put this as concretely as I can, there are probably quite a few people watching this who, who've seen the BBC drama Sherwood. And I thought that, that it opens with the most surprising and fascinating clip. It's Margaret Thatcher. Now, Margaret Thatcher, surely of any politician until the last five years, is the British figure in, in, the, in, in, in our recent modern history who's most inclined to ignore what the law actually said, whether that's international law, the about Grano, whether that's criminal law, the use of um, police, beyond any powers I had during the mind strike. But she's there, the clip is in the middle of the mind strike, and she's talking about why the miners are wrong. She says, what the miners represent is the rule of the mob rather than the rule of law. So just at the moment where the state was breaking the law most um, outrageously, the ideological stakes and the need to emphasize the supposed neutrality law were actually at the highest. So I, I don't think you can, you can only see the kind of, the, the, the way in which the capitalist class is trying to rig the rules of the game. You also have to see that there is a game, and and it zigzags between emphasise it between between cheating, <laughs> and emphasise that we're all in the game really, we've all got to be bound by the rules. Um, and th those two, both those two happen constantly, and it's not one or the other; it's both. Thanks. There's an interesting point from Richard who says, where is the dynamic going to come from in the Labour movement to fight dismissals, uh, personal misconduct dismissals, um, restructuring dismissals, etc., in the pre-1990s way through industrial action? My own experience is that our trade union bureaucracies like juridification. It has diminished a shop steward and makes every form of trade union action allegedly dependent on legal advice, whether that's true or not. I wonder what you make of that. Well, look, I, th I think the short answer to the question is the thing which is most likely to, to break apart the, the present trade union's relatively cosy relationship with the law is if they're compelled by the, the circumstances in which they're in to look outside the law and to seek remedies which aren't initially legal remedies. And, and you know, I, I come back to the RMT strike, which I mentioned earlier, and I come back to all the strikes which are going on surround it, some successfully. Um, the, there's a reason why trade unions are doing all those things, because there is no mechanism in the law to keep wages in, in line with inflation. For 40 years, we've been in a low inflation moment. Suddenly, we're in a high inflation moment. And the, the social problems posed by high inflation situation are different. As a, as a trade union, you can't just say, I've been on the phone to my legal lawyer and they've come up with this weird scheme. Or you can't just say, shut up, you idiot. I've got an opinion from my solicitor which says that your, your side in some battle ought to lose. You have to, if you're going to remain um, meaningful to you, you have to do all sorts of things in terms of returning to your base, returning to rank and file, returning to strike action, mobilising. Now, it might be from the point of view of the leadership, you want to keep all those processes nice and controlled. You know, I worked for trade unions as a bureaucrat for two years now, I, I can tell you as many stories of anyone seeing officials behaving shocking ways towards towards the members and being completely brazen behind closed doors about it. But the fact remains that if you, as the officials, are forced to mobilise the base, the base then remembers its social power, and it takes that social power back into everything else it does. And again, I mean, if if you've worked with different unions, I mean, I I I very often am struck by a number of different unions. One of them is the civil service union and one of them is the RMT. The RMT, because it's a union that strikes, is also a union where its members have a completely different social relationship to, to legal action, um, including legal action to, to prevent um, dismissal than any other union. They have it written into their contract with, um, with Thompson, as I understand, that if, for example, someone um, is dismissed and the union and the union solicitor advised not to take that to court, the members can have a petition within the workplace put that to the general sector, and if a majority of them want something done, the general sector will get a second advice. And Thompson's agreed to that and let that be paid for, as I understand. 
So, so people have taken their, their attitude of negotiation, bargaining, industrial power from their relationship to the employer and used it in relation to their union and the way it accesses legal resources. So that, that to me it seems the answer. It's people more, people more confident, not because of anything that's changed in law, but because social relationships outside of change, taking that confidence and then using it to, in other situations as well. That's, I think, the way in which pra in practice that change would happen. Yeah, sorry to talk shock, but I think a really good example of this is the barrister strike that's going on at the moment because yeah. barristers, as you can imagine, are defined by their relationship with the law. And having gone on strike, they have found their confidence, right? It just so happened to be the week after the RMT strike when confidence was at a high. But their whole approach to, to their working relationship seems to have changed by the very act of striking and, and being on that picket. Yeah, and I, I really do want to say, because there are some lawyers listening, but some non-lawyers as well, I, I really cannot emphasise this enough. If you are lawyers and you're going back and campaign and you're the head of that campaign, I can tell you what happens to your email tree. You are getting, the head of the CBA right now will be getting emails, 10 to 20 every minute going, dear whoever it is, thank you very much for your strike. I've thought of a really good, clever legal argument. If only we could find a court to argue about, but I'm convinced this argument could. They'll be getting them morning, noon and night saying, here is a legal avenue for doing. But barristers themselves have chosen not to go down the legal room in the most direct and obvious way possible. And let alone how that changes barristers, please, anyone else watching, let that change you. If we've seen the limits of the law in order to secure our pay, we've grasped it. That isn't because we gave up on the law. It's because we, we know the law and we can see what's out there. Yeah, um, I've got another question from Daniela. I think it's the last one we've got so far. So if you've got any more, please do send them in um, while Dave is answering. Um, do you think there is an important distinction to be made between not pooling the majority of the less resources into things like strategic litigation and pushing for legal reform in the one hand and disengagement with the law on the other? If engaging with the law is left to the liberals and the right, then the danger is the left is just left out of legal developments. Or is the argument that disengagement would ultimately be beneficial as it would help dispel an illusion that the law is in its current form could ever really serve the left's interest? If there should be some engagement in what areas of law is this most important, do you think? OK, look, I think what I'm talking about is this strategic disengagement from the law, but I'm not necessarily talking about the tactical disengagement from the law. In other words, what I'm saying is that people in whatever social movement you find yourself should be thinking, how can we empower social movements? And if the answer is we can empower them through litigation, etc., looking for other solutions first. That, that's really where we are strategically. Um, we need to have people on the streets, we need to have people in mass movements, we need to have people petitioning, we need to be looking at that as the key. But this strategic um, disengagement from the law isn't necessarily a tactical one. Um, you know, if I was a protest lawyer and I was representing, um, um, for example, people associated with XR or any of all the other different campaigns that now exist wonderfully, um, who, who are taking the streets against um, global warming, um, I would not strategically disengage from the law by saying to those people, right, let the courts do whatever they like. I don't need to defend you. <laughs> um, let the courts do their worst. Um, I might say to them, for example, a strategic disengagement from the law um, might well take other forms. It might say, all right, well, why didn't we see about, if there's 10 people um, who, are all, um, who are all on trial, why don't we have one represented by lawyers so that I can take all the legal arguments we need nine representing themselves? It might take a, a, a tactical disengagement from the law, might think, how can we look at models from history, whether that's something like the trial of the Chicago 7, or um, the Oz trial here, which were all about trying to make the law look uncomfortable, make the judges look like monsters, trying to embarrass the court system. And there have been lots of other models of that, um, from, for example, movements against imperialism, have repeatedly set out and say, all right, what we're trying to do in this process, we might have a lawyer in the room, but what we're trying to do fundamentally is discredit the law as a way of penalising us. So, Strategic disengagement means just generally all around, just passing around the message. We're all looking too much at the law. But tactical disengagement might well take the form of using opportunities that are presented to us to, to raise um, a different argument and letting that happen within the law, but always being against the law. That's the fundamental thing, always against the law, whatever form we do and how we find the way of going about that. 
Thanks. Um, there's a comment from Mohammed about um, trade union notice provisions. Um, apart from that, I think that's the end of the questions. Unless David, there's anything anything you'd like to add at the end there? I'm just going to look at Mohammed's. If you don't mind, yeah. I'm going to read it to myself because it's quite long. So the trade unions have to give timely notice before taking action. Has relied a huge loss of length and even time notice can't. Be yeah, look, it's right that trade unions do have to give notice, but again, um, what I want to emphasise is, and and you know, that's not by any means the only thing trade unions have to do. We've now got this ludicrous situation where under under this government, we've allowed them to change law again. So now that you don't just need an ordinary um, majority in the budget, you need to have a majority of the people who are eligible to participate in, in the ballot. Also, you have to have a majority in those terms too. And, you know, think how few MPs would still be in the House of Commons if as a minimum requirement to win an election, you need to have actually 50% of the voters in your patch. I think probably five, six of them would lose their seats. So it's completely arbitrary and ridiculous, and no relationship to what we, we ever consider democracy. But yes, the the the, the um, yes, capital has acquired all sorts of legal instruments to make it very difficult for the sort of trade union revival that I'm talking about. But the fact is, even with capital making it really difficult. Through this year, a whole series of workers have won inflation busting pay rises. Cadbury's work is 17.5%. Um, all over the shop, people are finding that a relatively small amount, even the threat of strike action, putting that to employers who've never faced the reality of strike action, they found terrifying, and, and workers' confidence is rising. Yes, from a very low base, but it is objectively rising. And, and, and I, just, I just think that when things like that are happening, it's worth seeing them and savouring that moment. Because, you know, on the left, we have enough defeats. We have enough reasons to feel miserable. And when actually things are going in direction, which enables us to talk about this much bigger notion of workers' power and, and, and workers um, transforming the world, then, you know, even if it's from very low place, things are going our way right now. I think it's worth seeing that's happening. Thanks. Did, did, we, did we have one last one from Declan as yeah, well? Yeah, whether you want to wade into the row about um, whether Scotland should adhere to uh, requirements that the referendum be legal, perhaps with reference to Irish history. <laughs> well, if they're going to do in Ireland at some point, they're just going to have to say, um, we, don't, um, we don't care what Britain thinks anymore. I mean, that, or what England thinks. That, that, that's the moment... It, that's the moment when, when you gen when when independence is genuinely real when you cross that psychological threshold and say well if you do your worst because you're certainly not going to send the army up here to make us be part of the union we no longer want to be in um if i can say something about Ireland, something different though mm. um one of the things i was reading for the book which which i found fascinating was the whole history from about 1918 so in that four or five years when when independence is being won, but it's not yet the fact on the ground. Um, how much of, of what was going on in the law at that moment, how you saw the creation of these sort of independence or some called nationalist or Sinn Féin courts or whatever, but it just happened in dozens and dozens of places and all sorts of people really interested from Irish history, often with no legal experience whatsoever, suddenly reinvented themselves and having the power um, in criminal cases and family cases, in fact, and, and even in, in sort of civil disputes, suddenly take decisions. And I, I think that, you know, um, there's some very good books. I mean, I think someone called Frank Lebdige's book of Rebel Law, I think, which talks about, and there are other books too. And I have to say that that was, you know, that was some part of Irish history, which I think all of us could learn from in terms of that sense. That the, the institutions, which seem so permanent, it seems inevitable, they've always got this form. You can't go to the Royal courts of justice without having the thought go through and say, you know, this is their power it's been there 100 years you know probably it's going to be there another 100 years time because unfortunately that's just the way these things go but actually the institutions do fall mm. um actually people take them over people do repurpose them all these things the law all of it any of it it's only there to serve social purposes and if enough people are persuaded it doesn't serve the social purpose anymore then we can change it that's what we're working towards. David, uh, thank you so much uh, for a fascinating discussion. And thanks to Alice and everyone at Houseman's. Um, Against the Law is uh, out now with Repeater. It is, of course, available at Houseman's. Um, please do pick up a copy. You're, you're sure to find it fascinating. Uh, and thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And have a lovely evening. Thank you.